Hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks for making it to our session, Code Quality, the way of the Salesforce developer. A little bit about us. I'm Farah Sharif. I, am, I have been working in the Salesforce ecosystem for four years now. Uh, I work as a senior Salesforce developer at Oloop. And uh, I'm a Salesforce MVP and a community group leader in Egypt. Uh, and my name is Justina Gergis. I am the Salesforce technical lead at Pylons. And uh, I've actually worked with Farah on so many great projects where we discussed lots of things about code quality and best practices. So we thought we would share with you some of what we have learned. In the agenda for today, we will talk about best practices in terms of security, performance, maintainability, scalability, and design. And uh, finally, there will be a very useful tool, uh, Salesforce Code Analyzer. So without further ado, let's get started. Security is one of the most important topics in code quality. Um, so if you are publishing your app on App Exchange, uh, it will go through something called the security review. And this is a process where you need to make sure that your code is secure and that user running the code has access to whatever the code logic is implementing. So um, let's get started with some of the best practices for security. Um, so we know that Apex is running in system mode, which means it gives access to uh, records and permissions. So uh, you should declare a sharing model to make sure that the user uh, has um, access to the records that they need to work on. So there are three sharing modes with sharing. Uh, with sharing, make sure that the user running the code has access to the records uh, that they are working with. Without sharing, it does not enforce sharing rules. So you use it when you want to, uh, the user have to have access to all records. And inherited sharing is um, um, depends on the code that is calling the inherited sharing class. So if you have a class um, that is with sharing and then that class is calling an inherited sharing class, uh, the inherited sharing class will have the sharing mode as with sharing. The second thing for security, now we have talked about system mode and how it gives access to records and permissions. Now with user mode, you can enforce permissions, field level security, and sharing rules. Um, so user mode is a new feature that is now generally available. Uh, you can use it in your SQL or social query. So you use it like this. Basically, in the end of the query, you just add with user mode. And this in, uh, ensures that the, f the user has the access to the fields in the query. It ensures that the records returned, uh, also the user has access to the records returned, and also ensures that the object that, is, uh, that the user is querying on, um, uh, the user has access to as well. You can also use the user mode in the DML operations. So uh, as you can see here, instead of just saying delete account list, I'm saying delete as user account list. And this enforces uh, the user mode for DML. So if anything here that the user doesn't have access to, it will just uh, throw an exception. Uh, the other best uh, practice for uh, security is to avoid uh, or prevent SQL injection. And uh, SQL injection happens with uh, dynamic queries. And uh, it happens when you, have, um, you are, when you are expecting an input from the user. So let's say you have a Visual Force page. And in this page, you are uh, getting the name uh, of the contact from the user. And then in this Visual Force page, you are calling an Apex class. And the Apex class is querying for contact, where the name is matching whatever the user supplied in the input. So in this case, if the user supplied contact name as Astro, that will not be a problem. But the problem happens when, let's say, the user supplied something like what is there in the line two here. So um, in this case, it's not just querying for a name. It's also doing um, a command. So in this case, it's returning all contacts instead of just returning one contact. And this is risky because, let's say, you are sending an email to the contact. Uh, um, the, to the context that you are querying, or maybe doing an, a, a DML operations. So that's risky. Um, so the way to sanitize the input coming from the user is to use uh, bind variables. And uh, um, basically, you do it uh, like it's shown over here. And with bind variables, it removes the single code. 
um, it, 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 it makes the single code act as a string, but not as a database command. So, um, so you should use bind variables with your dynamic queries whenever you have an, an input to prevent SQL injection. In some cases, you might not be able to use bind variables. So that's when you can use escape single quotes method instead. And that would also um, do the same thing, basically. Now we'll talk about some best practices for performance. And performance is important to make sure that your uh, code, whether it's a Lightning Web component or Apex has, runs in a timely manner. So the first uh, best practice for performance is to avoid operations with limits in loops. And operations with limits could be SOCL, SOCL, DML, or sending an email, or basically any operation that, sends an, uh, that's, that has limits. Uh, so in this example here, I am counting the number of contacts for each account. And I'm doing it uh, by doing a SOCL query inside my loop and also a DML. Uh, and now we know that is not good because basically we have governor limits. Uh, in Apex and in Salesforce, and we could hit the governor limits easily with just 200 accounts. So one of the ways that you could solve that is to utilize maps, and maps have a special data structure where you can have, like, uh, let's say, key, which is, let's say, account ID, and then the value, uh, which is a list of contacts. So now, if I have if I, contract, if I construct a map, I have for each account ID, I have the list of contacts that uh, uh, belong to this account. So in the code here, I have uh, um, built my map using methods like get and put. And then I am looping on my uh, map and then again using map.get to get the number, uh, to get the list of contacts, and then list.size to get the number of contacts, and then doing an update outside of the for loop. So I have also prevented the DML inside of the for loop by utilizing lists. The other best, uh, best practice for performance is to use SQL for loops. And this is what a SQL for loop looks like. Uh, basically, if, uh, instead of having a list um, to store your records, and you need to query on those records, you can just use uh, SQL for loops. And this is uh, good because let's say you have multiple lists, and each list has like, 40,000 or 50,000 uh, contacts or accounts. Now, this would take up a good amount of your heap size. And heap size is a memory uh, allocated for storing runtime data, like maps, variables, um, uh, lists. So, so this would take up a good amount of your heap size. And in Salesforce, we have heap size limit. Uh, so, so that's why it's good to use SQL for loops for performance as well. And now on to some uh, best practices for design. And design is uh, important to make sure that your code is readable. So let's dig into some of uh, the best practices. So first be best practice for design is to avoid nested if and nested for. And this is important because um, if, if you have nested ifs and you have nested fors in your code, it means that your code has complexity. And uh, it means basically that it's harder to maintain and troubleshoot. So in the code shown here, again, I am using the famous example of counting the number of contacts for an account. But in this time, I have, um, uh, I'm counting the active contacts uh, for an account. And I have a nested if and a nested for as well. And I don't need to have that in my code. I could just solve it um, using this way. So again, there are numerous ways to solve this, but in, in, in this code, I have, cho I have chosen to solve it using um, filtering my query. So I, instead of having multiple if conditions, I am filtering my SQL query for the records that I need only, so that it only returns the records that I need. And then I am looping on the uh, map. Uh, I, am, I have created a map, like the example I shown before. And then I'm looping on my map and gen just utilizing get and, uh, and uh, put to get the size of the uh, contacts for an account, the active contacts. And now, um, another best practice for um, design is to divide your code into methods. As you can see here, um, so if, if the person reviewing your code uh, opens a method and then it's like 200 or 300 lines of, of code, it's, it's not going to be good to troubleshoot or it's not going to be readable. So that's why it's important to divide your code into methods. 
And whenever you have a piece of code, wh whether like ha no matter how small it is, but it can be it can be moved into a method, and this way it's easier to troubleshoot, so that the person troubleshooting the code or reviewing the code, they are focusing on a certain piece of the code, but not like reading 200 or 400 lines of code. And now uh, we will talk about uh, maintainability. Justina will share uh, with us some of the best practices of maintainability. Thank you, Farah. So um, right now I'm going to talk to you about maintainability. So uh, first thing is naming conventions. Um, you would need to follow a good naming convention, uh, which is an agreed upon guidelines uh, and patterns that you follow. Um, so that's very important because you need your code to be consistent, you need it to be readable, and also it makes debugging much easier. So if you look here, we have some naming conventions for your class name, your method, variables, and so on. So these are all good to follow. Uh, next thing is you should uh, obviously avoid hard coding. There's no way that you should hard code anything in your code or elsewhere. So uh, to work around that, you could use custom labels. In case you're, you want to output a message to the user, it's best if you use a custom label. Or if you need, for example, to use a record type, it's better if you retrieve it programmatically instead of hard coding it. Or if you're just querying a record, you could also do that directly instead of hard coding. Uh, and my favorite is to use custom metadata types. So uh, you could obviously uh, use it, uh, and it's deployable. So uh, you could have, um, and also you could query it. So you could use it uh, to retrieve the record. So as you can see here, uh, I have a custom metadata type called account settings. And I set uh, the batch size there so that my code is more dynamic. I could change the batch size whenever I need. And I don't need to rely on the SQL engine to retrieve it. Instead, I could use the get all or the get instance method, which uh, doesn't consume from my limits. Um, next thing I'm going to talk about is scalability. Um, so it's very important to uh, ensure that your code is bulkified. So as you can see here, we have an invocable method. And this one is invoked from a flow. So we know that flows are uh, bulk ready. So it, they are designed to be bulk. But when you are invoking your Apex, you have to build it and design it to be bulk. So if you don't do that, on the first import, your, uh, everything is going to fail. Your flow is going to fail, and your import is going to fail. Um, Next thing, you need to consider uh, these when you're working with large data volumes. So let's say you're working with more than 50,000 records. You would need to consider using maybe a batch class. Or if you're putting that information to the user, you could also use pagination. Uh, also, you should consider when you're importing data or when you're dealing with bulk API. Um, to avoid record locking. So you can do that by sorting by the parent ID, which uh, will help prevent that issue, but it will not eliminate it. But it would be better if you do that. Uh, and lastly, you would need to optimize your queries. And you can do so by um, uh, like working. At, like You could use, um, uh, there is a tool that Salesforce provides for you called the query planner. So you can use that, which will enable you to see if your query is, um, is efficient or not. And finally, I'm going to talk to you guys about the code analyzer. So the code analyzer uh, was previously called CLI scanner. So if you hear that word anywhere, it's basically the same thing. And it's a free tool provided by Salesforce. Uh, it has it supports many engines such as PMD, ESLint, RetireJS, Copy Paste Detector, and Salesforce Graph Engine. Um, so you can run it by using that command line on top there. And once you run it, it would output something like that for you. It will show you m lots of the issues that you could have with your code, and many of the issues that we have actually discussed today would be would show up from the code analyzer. So as you can see here, uh, it, sh it shows you if you have issues with naming conventions, 
if you have sharing violations, uh, if, there, if your code is complex, it will also show you that. Um, and that's it. And here are our resources. You can scan this to, um, for the code analyzer installation and one of our favorite logging, uh, error logging framework and then some Apex recipes provided by Salesforce. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, please don't forget to share your feedback. Uh, for or you, you could uh, win a pass for Dreamforce 2024. Thank you. Thank you.